Hey up everybody and welcome back. Right, well, what can I say? It's raining. Uh, it's chilly again. But apart from that, everything is moving along. So, yeah, just hold it. So what we're going to do today, which is why we're measuring this, is build the box for the swinging arm. So we've got to, uh, you see I've got a sprocket stuck in there. I'm actually going to use a smaller one. Uh, and I made up a little thing here, which you'll see. We're going to check where we want this, and then we can uh, start to cut out the pieces and make the box, put the box on. But I'll explain all that later. So, uh, there's only two things. One, as you may have noticed from the little note at the beginning, I completely forgot about showing you the plates. Showed you the back one, showed you the top one, but I didn't show you how I did the front ones, which was simple enough. But there's a couple of little things I want to mention that you might find of use if you put a different engine into a frame or if you make your own frame. So we'll do that in a minute. And the other thing is, I did ask about the problem as I was having parting off, and I got quite a lot of comments. So I'll just spend a minute to go through that. First of all, I got a couple of people who mentioned things like the headstock bearings and stuff. It isn't that I'm having trouble parting off, it was just that one piece. In fact, the great thing since I got the Sheldon lathe was it is so massive, it's so heavy and rigid that parting off has been great. This is the only lathe where I've actually used the cross feed. I feel confident enough to just set it going and it cuts off no problem. And secondly, that parting off tool as I said it's something I would never buy I'm fortunate I have a friend who sells machine tools and uh, cutting tools and it was sort of a ex demonstrator model so he gave me it with several replacement blades and they're expensive so I know it's a really good parting off tool and everything is fine it was exactly what I thought it was I had a word with my friend Dick who I've mentioned before machinist extraordinaire Hello Dick. And um, he sort of confirmed what I thought. He mentioned the type of steel it was and what have you. It was just a little soft and gummy. And he recommended I run it at 500 RPM for that diameter. So I had enough left to put it in the lathe and I spun it up to that speed and used the cutoff tool and plenty of oil and it ran through it a treat. So that's what it was. It was basically just that particular grade of steel didn't like uh, being at very low feet per minute speed. All right, so thank you very much for all those people who wrote in. I'm always pleased to hear from people who know more things than, than I do. So I take uh, their comments to heart. All right, so first of all, we've got some playing about with uh, with cardboard stuff like that before we start cutting pieces but as I mentioned let me just cover a couple of things on these front engine plates yes yeah I'm going to come to that in a minute right now what I'm going to do is describe three ways of doing this and uh, hopefully I won't get in the way now I was very fortunate here in that I had the original engine plate. So I was able to put it on there when this tube was here. And you see from the other side, I just drew a line where I wanted the, that to go. Then I cut my alloy to that size. And as you saw me do at the back, I put some die chem on, I bolted it on nice and tight. And then I just marked the mountains because they were already there through that so that was really easy to make these so that's one way if you're lucky enough to have the original plates now if you're making them up from scratch there are two ways to do it uh, no there are three ways to do it really no there are two ways I'm waffling again because one way really is the way I've just saw and shown you you cut yourself a template that fits there big enough to go out here and you mark it from the other side which is what I did there okay secondly what you can do is see here we're very close and 
it wasn't that difficult. Now, for instance, the triumph tube comes right down to here and you have one mounting. So if you were just wanting to fit that into there, things might get difficult. So you can do it using a pair of compasses. So what you would do is you need three measurements. You would measure two holes like that and then you would measure from the centre to the centre and from the centre to the centre from the centre to the centre. Those three measurements. Now this one you would lay out on your piece of paper, your piece of cardboard and then with your compass you would set it to that measurement and draw an arc and then you'd set it to this measurement draw another arc and where they crossed would be the center point for that then you'd do the same for this one if there was two mountains right the third way to do it if they're really awkward is you make two templates actually I should have made this one smaller but you make one template that fits there and if you can imagine it you make one template that goes on the tube and you make them bigger than you need so you stick some bolts in there to hold it you put that on your tube and stick some bolts in to hold it and then you put some tape on and you make if you like a composite template you know it doesn't even have to be as closely cut as this it could just be a big square piece and then when you've got it nicely taped and you know where all the holes are you can just cut it out to the shape you want and then cut your alloy so that's that now let's get on to looking at this uh, rear swinging arm and where we're going to mount it all right here we have basically the size of sprocket we're going to have that's for a BSA but it's 520 and it's whatever it is 13 tooth which is I think the size the smallest size I get from D&C up in North Yorkshire so that's going to be the diameter there I've worked out all the gear ratios I always aim for 40 to 1 overall in first gear so to get that with the smaller crankshaft sprocket I can get the smaller gearbox sprocket I need 60 teeth on the rear okay now this 60 teeth is roughly 12 inch diameter this is three and a half and this is three is two and a half so that's six so that's a six inch radius that's a 12 inch diameter so what we're going to do is we're going to put that there and we're going to put that there that's where it would be at rest okay now the 14 inch shocks I'm getting rear suspension units I keep using that horrible American term although they call them rock shocks but anyway never mind I'm rambling again um, they have just under four inches of travel so as I say that white piece of card is three and a half so what we've got to do is watch this chain line right there it is so now it's going to start coming up as the wheel would that's three and a half inches of travel and we're still going up okay and we're not touching that so that is where it should be that I think was fine now you can see here how if I'd made those plates go the triangle go down I wouldn't be able to get this box on but that just nicely gives us enough space and I think it even comes out roughly to uh, the otter measurement which was uh, 16 16 and a half something like that oh see 16 and a half so that is going to be fine I know people have mentioned that I should check it with it full compression what difference does it make we moved our thing up to where it would be at full compression where the wheel would be and we've got the clearance we're fortunate in that having having such a big rear sprocket all right see so that'll go right up there so it's still not touching that that's it that's there look and that's way more far more than uh, three and a half inches of travel oops 
I think he's fallen out. I'm not sure if I've ordered new ones of those. Because those ones are out of my uh, trials bike, which I've got a part to paint. Alright, so now we know where that's going to be. We'll leave that chopped there for now. Let's go and look at how we're going to measure all this out and make the box. So here's the first little bit of planning. The end of the box is going to be two inches square because the cross piece of the swinging arm is inch and a half so I'm giving myself a quarter inch top bottom and back the front doesn't matter in fact I might even cut a little bit off I notice because it might catch on a mounting on the swinging arm but that gives me a quarter of an inch clearance the uh, the frame tube is going to go here all right so if I make it two inches square that would be right up to the frame tube but I'd have a quarter of an inch and then I have a quarter of an inch all round okay you know the swinging arm goes out like that then I thought seems a bit pointless to make the box and then make another plate to mount the footrests on so the next thing I wanted was the footrest placement now I wanted it below and just behind the swinging arm pivot so I sort of wanted it like that now then this is the footrest I'm going to use it has a piece that goes on this end so you'll see it's at an angle that's because if you look there see it's not square that is so when that's in vertically or sorry when that's vertical I don't want this to keep going out of focus if you hit it it'll swivel back just like everybody told me I should have done the ones on the uh, Yambasaki, but minor point on that. On the these, where you're going in between rocks, it's much more important than racing around in the dirt. So that was my basic design. So then what I did was I made a two inch square and a one inch square, which is what that piece is. All right. So I'll move you on to the next phase in a second. I want to look and make sure you've been in picture all the time. Next thing is to transfer it to a piece of cardboard. So one other thing I mentioned, mentioned, measured, was as you saw, this is 16 and a half inches high. I might actually drop that down a little bit. I'll work on it a bit more. The footrests, if you go out and look at your trials bike, you'll find that the footrest is almost always on a line between the two front and rear wheel spindles which puts them about 13 inches 13 and a half inches off the ground so if this is 16 16 and a half off the ground and this is going to be 13 and a half that's two and a half to three inches down so I knew roughly where I wanted that to be okay so what I did was I put that there and then I got this there's where the wheel spin the swinging arm spindle is going to be so I know I needed it to be behind there a bit and I need that to be at an angle and I need it to be a couple of three inches down below that so I sorted all that out held them in place and drew around them and then that gave me this then the next thing I did was I added a little piece where I'm going to mount the rear brake pedal now what I'm going to do is make two identical plates so that you can have the brake pedal on either side see if I use like as now I'm using a Japanese rear hub the brake is going to be the brake plate is going to be on the right hand side so if I want to keep the brake pedal on the left I'm going to have to run a cable over or some sort of cross shaft or if I'm going to put it on the right which is what I think I'm going to do just because most people are used to the uh, brake pedal being on the right and on the triumph with the kickstart i can get for it it won't f the brake pedal won't foul anything i'll have this plate on both sides so you could swap it over now the other thing is i'm making the box out of i think it's three sixteenths and it's 41 30. but i'm going to make the ends out a quarter inch and that's because 
In the past when I've made these, particularly when they're not part of a great big box, you'll find the pressure on the footrests, particularly if you keep running into rocks as uh, some of us are prone to do, will bend this. It'll bend it back like that. In fact, on my BSA on the back side, I welded some strengthening ribs and I may even do that here. So I decided quarter was, was the best. All right, so that is going to be the end piece. We'll make two identical ones. We'll do what we did before when we've got them made. I'll tack weld them together and we'll drill there and there. This one's the more important one to make sure that the two holes are in identical spots, both ends of the box. Now then, the rest of the box. So, hang on a minute. We are going to have an end to it like that. You can't see it. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. How's that? There. So that will be there like that. With our footrest sticking out here. Okay. This will have a top, it'll have a back, it'll have a bottom. That's the bit I mentioned. See, that's going to come up. So what I might do is, although it'll be welded to here, I might just come in, make the box here, not two inches, say one and three quarters, just scallop it there. Okay. So then we need a top and a bottom. And as I say, if I make this box two inches, then the top piece being two inches wide will go right up against that inch and three quarter tube so I've made a seven eighth inch semicircle so that's going to go on there like that right and we'll have our end pieces and bottom piece what I'm going to do is we'll make the box on the swinging arm so I'll make the ends I'll put the ball through, the spindle through, fasten them up tight, cut the top and bottom and then set them on and I can make sure everything's square. We'll have this actually on the welding table and I'll make the box. Then we'll bring it over here, we'll set it where we want it. I can do some tacks up here and I can do some tacks, if you imagine this is the bottom, on the bottom of it. Then we'll take the swinging arm out. Then we will bronze it in all the way around above and below but then what I'm going to do and the reason see the I noticed on the the otter ones this comes across here and goes round sort of thing well that strikes me as being a weak point so I've made it straight so what I'm going to do then is as I say we'll have top bottom we'll have ends I'm going to weld a piece in here so it'll be welded to the top and bottom of that and then trying to keep everything in sight here it'll be on here so I can weld it down there as well so nothing will be able to do that so now I'm going to go and cut some metal I'm going to have a little look at where this swinging arm is a bit more and play around make sure I'm happy with it and where the footrest is in fact let me show you something little red lights on the camera for the battery okay so that is going to go on there like that and that is going to go on there like that so as I say I'm a little bit behind and below that I could make it here no I'm gonna leave it there is that too far back hmm Actually, it doesn't matter because, of course, this thing isn't going to be welded on there. There's a U-shaped bracket that this bolts into. So I can make the whole of this and then I can even just put the bracket on with a couple of little tacks. Put this in and see what I thought of it. Could almost do it the very last thing. And then when I'm happy with it, whoops, like that. Because this could be anywhere on this plate. It doesn't have to be sticking out there. You know, I could have it up here if I wanted long as it didn't foul the nut so we'll leave that for now let's get these cut we can always reshape the end of this even after I've made the box even after it's on the bike none of it matters so let's go and cut the top bottom two ends right I've dropped this an inch 
and I've adopted slightly different method to make it easier to show you. See this here, this rule? That is the bottom of the sprocket. It's six inches away from here. That is four inches of travel. Right, so if I put that on that sprocket, that's where the chain will start. And don't forget you're looking for the clearance here where the swinging arm is. So it will start there and it will come up to there. And I've still got loads of space. Chain's not going to be a problem. So I'm going to leave it there. That's now 15 and a half inches. And I think for that I might move this just forward a little bit. I can still fit it all on. The brake pedal point is fine. Right, so let's go and cut some steel. I forgot to mention, I bolted the manifold on and the carb and uh, checked that that cable went through there nicely, it's all fine. So now I'll cut some plate. All right, we get to our cutting. So here's the quarter inch I'm gonna use for the ends. And this is 160. I probably could have used eighth inch here, which would have been 125. But, uh, and I'll use eighth inch for those pieces I'm gonna put in there. But I just wanted to go, I thought I'd rather go over a little bit than under. So anyway, just out of interest, I'll show you that um, whenever I get the uh, alloy steels from this particular supplier, McMaster car here in the US, they always come with actual certificate of analysis. So, uh, I know exactly I've got the right stuff. So, I've taken the trouble this time. See, there's our templates. One there, one there. So what I've done this time, rather than do it freehand, because freehand is quick, but the trouble is then you spend forever filing and grinding and what have you. So I've made up a couple of templates as guides to the plasma cutter, right? I guess those two sides I needn't have cut it shorter so what these are these are a quarter inch smaller than the actual template because the burning the hole in the nozzle with the flame for the plasma cutter is a quarter of an inch away from its edge so when I put the plasma cutter up against that it's actually burning a quarter of a way so if I just made one that size I would have ended up with a piece cut quarter of an inch too big all the way around so there are those two they're all ready so what I'm going to do is we'll clamp that down to there then we'll clamp that on there and then I can just hopefully go around easily get that so I think we'll make these first because I've got drilling in various things now the important thing is you see I've got to make sure that these are square because you know this end is going to go on there where are we that would go on like that so when i put everything together i've got to make sure that that is square to that all right let me get these clamped down and get the plasma cutter out right then let's see what sort of a mess i can make of this which way we want to go around like that yeah that's what we'll try Now I know that bit wasn't good because I got some sparks coming back up. But the rest of it looks alright.
You see other people using these and they just go through and it's done. See, there's still just little bits. I don't go completely smoothly. I don't know why. It seems to drag. Try again. Now, oh, if any of you are wondering why I'm not using my big bandsaw, it's because my idea of using a DC motor and what have you, well, I guess I didn't have a big enough motor. Anyway, it burst into flames yesterday. So I've ordered a larger three-phase motor, and I could just wire it up to the three-phase, but what I've done is I've got a VFD for it, so I can slow it down. All right, let me... Look at these. Well, this one's basically straight line, so let's see if I can make a better job. I cut the other one out and I've started to uh, shape them, but I thought I might as well cut them all and then they can be cooling. Are you ready for this? Well that was better and I'll tell you what, I noticed as I was doing it that the cut was a lot cleaner, it wasn't as wobbly like that. Alright, let me mark up another one. Right, so that's those two cut out. I still have this to cut out. What I've done is I made sure they're exactly the same length and square at the corners. So I will measure halfway, put a line. Measure seven eighths either side, put a line, and that will give me my one and three quarters for the tube. Measure two inches in from here and mark it, and that will show me exactly where I need to cut that out, as opposed to where I've sort of got it. It should be there, because that's where the template puts it, but uh, that will make absolutely certain. Then these, I've, uh, I've tacked them together, and just tacked them at one end so I can split them from this end. Made sure they're square and two inches and everything like that. So I've got a final little bit of dressing up to do to make sure they're identical. And then we'll drill a 5 8 hole from in there. And then I can mount this on the swinging arm and use the swinging arm and a couple of blocks as a jig to hold it all together while I weld, let's see, yeah, that under there like that at each side. Okay, so let's uh, do some marking up. Right, well, I've got these marked up. As I say, there's my centre line. Inch and three quarters. Two inches up from there. And you can just about see the black from the original uh, template, from the cardboard template. In fact, I suppose I could do that and you'll see it. Okay, and also, I've drilled my two holes in there. So now I'll just uh, pop a wedge in and split this. And then I've got to cut these out. I had thought, first off, that I might use the hole saw to do the hole first and then cut it. But 
I wasn't sure how that would work out with having the gap, you know, from the, what do you call it, the actual cut when you're using a torch, scarf, scarf, something like that. Anyway, I did them this way. So what I think I'm going to do is uh, put a cutting disc. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do what um, the fellow that builds the bicycles that people keep mentioning to me. I've watched some of his videos. A lot of the times when he has something like that, he actually just drills lots of holes and then thumps it out with a hammer and then cleans it up. So that's what I'll do. I'll put it in the, uh, the mill. And we'll put a nice drill in and go around and do that. So there's a row of holes drilled. I couldn't get any closer because the parallel was here, even using the very thin parallel. So I just cut a little saw cut in there, a little saw cut in there. That'll bop out and then I'll just file those. So let me do that and do the other one. Now that worked out uh, pretty good actually. Nice sharp drill, it was quite quick. And there's a piece of one and three quarter. All right, so let me do the other one and then we can actually put our box together. Right then, we've got all the components nicely cleaned up, ready. So, what we're gonna do is we are going to put this together. Now I'm gonna use a couple of cardboard washers. And when we tighten this up, these will squish down pretty thin and uh, they'll give us a few foul clearance and enough for some paint. Actually, this cardboard might be too thick. We'll see how it crushes down. And I've put that on the wrong way around, haven't I? Let's have a look. It's going to go on that way. Okay, it goes on there like that, goes on there, that's going to go on there, like that, oh no these will squash up nicely. Let me get a couple of spanners. Tighten them up, they've squished up nicely. So I've cut these, they're not the full length. I've given myself a little bit of a shelf here to do the welding into. All right. So the blocks make sure the back of this is vertical. It doesn't matter about this if you're worried about that because that's going to go up and down. So we're going to put that in there. I'll check we're exactly the same length at each side. That means that's in the middle. And then we'll tack this. Then we'll turn the whole thing over and do the same on the bottom. Okay, so, ruler. Actually, what I've got, I've got to brought this as well. stuff about until we get everything where we want it. Okay. 
So anyway, I've explained what we're going to do. Obviously, as you can see, this is a bit of a fiddle on. So let me carry on and get myself ready and then I'll tack it. So there we go. Put a little bit of weight on. I'm in an eighth each side. So I'll say that gives me somewhere to weld. We're all square to each other. Everything is right. So let me just tack it and then we'll turn it over. All right, this is thick enough. It should tack up without using any rod. Okay. Right, there we are. Part one. So Now this one is going to go inside here. So I've got to put a piece on to, uh, to build it up to hold it. So let me get that organized. Right, here we are. So what I've done is I measured up two inches from the bottom plate and marked it. And then I've put this plate in so the bottom is on the, those marks, held it all in with magnets, Everything is square. I've even just checked that it's level. So all I've got to do now is put some uh, little bit of weld in there. So let's see if we can do that. Without things moving around. I know absolutely for certain I'm on the front of the lines. I'm going to move this so that I can check that I'm on the back lines as well. That's why I've just tacked it at the front so if need be I can just adjust it. But other than that, God these magnets are strong. So I can just tack them at the back. Tack, tack, tack. Now, I'm going to have to check, put it on, I may have to cut a little bit out, who knows. This is the first time I've ever done one of these, like this. But that is going to be good and strong. And as I say, what we're going to do is, talking here, am I moving you out of, out of shot? Let's have a look. Yeah, I was. Hold on. When we've got 
that bronzed in there I'm going to put two pieces in here like this what I'm probably going to do I think is mill out the center of it make it easier to clean it when there's mud in there but it'll still because it'll have pieces at each corner it'll stop it from doing that all right so before we get this all welded up I think we'll go and try it on the bike right so there it is I've got the wheel spindle in got it up against there so the first thing to check up on is is it horizontal oh sorry people so let me zoom you in zoom you in there you go 0, 0.00 and uh, just to show you what's going on here's the back wheel zero point zero zero and zero point zero zero this might be slightly out of focus I don't know actually I don't know if you can see it zero point zero zero now we're over on the drive side 0, 0.00 and these are all machined faces 0, 0.00 0, 0. so everything is good whoops I've got to turn you off there now I just thought I'd show you this in case any of you are thinking to yourself wait a minute now that there's this box thing there is his chain line still going to be all right so I actually did away with my bit of cardboard made a piece put a sprocket in there so we've still got our two marks that's at rest that is sort of full compression on the suspension units so starts there oh we're catching on the stand here hang on let me do it from here then I can still I've got my finger in there so it starts there that's well up past the thing past the mark and it's still on where the chain would be on the sprocket and of course on the top we've got loads of space we would be hang on difficult trying to hold everything and not get in the way <laughs> there's six inches so we're off the top and we've got plenty of room at the bottom okay everybody happy so what i'm going to do now is take this back off i'm going to weld the top and bottom both sides then we'll put it back on set it up tack it onto here and then i can bronze i'll take the swinging arm out i can bronze in the top on the outside and i can bronze in the bottom on the inside and then when we take the frame apart I'll do all the other bits of bronzing and put these pieces in the side as well now you have to bear with me here because sometimes I say I'm going to weld this just like you say vacuum cleaners are hoover so I'm planning to bronze all this up but you'll see so bronze that I actually cut a quarter inch off that and just fared it in just to make absolutely certain that would come up I left the bottom as it was because you know we're nice and clear down there there's there's no problem all right so the next thing for me to do is I'm going to tack this at the top and then see if I can get in and tack it at the bottom and then I'll take the swinging arm out because I don't want to just do it up here in case it makes it come up 
I want to at least get it tacked down at the bottom to hold it in place. Then I'll take the swinging arm out and as I say I'll go around here and I can get inside and go around the inside on the bottom plate. So let me uh, bring the welder over and we'll get that organised. I've got it tacked on now but I just thought, hang on let me walk around the other side of the camera. I just thought I'd show you this. As I say I took a quarter inch off the top, I took a quarter inch off the bottom as well just to be on the safe side. So as you can see, this goes, doesn't catch at all below. And it goes all the way up there, which is a total of... Seven inches of movement. And as I say, we only get about four. So I'm gonna take the swinging arm out I'm going to bronze in round the top there and bronze in round the top inside. I've actually bronzed these inside while I had the box off. So let me do that. Right, so there it is. Bronzed in there, bronzed in there. As I say, when I take the frame apart, I'll get in and do those other couple of parts. I also made these. They're going to go, actually you'll see from the other side better, I think. They're going to go on there like that. You see they'll get uh, obviously bronzed onto the box on three sides and the fourth side will be bronzed onto the tube. So that'll stop any chance of it doing that from side to side. Alright, well that's it for this week. Let me pull you out a little bit. Hang on a second. Next week, we're going to take the wheel out so that I can uh, put a couple of these on for up here. We'll put the swinging arm in and we're going to make the rear subframe and the top mounts for the rear suspension units. Which are going to, again, are going to be a little divergence from the Otter system, which uses the sort of standard thing of, of plates where there's the uh, rear suspension unit goes inside. I'm going to do the type that I do on the uh, on my trials bikes where it goes on to a projection if you like. The thing about that is it moves the tube in an inch on either side and I want to try and keep this as slim as I can. All right so that's it for this week. Uh, see you next week and until then stay safe and enjoy yourselves.